The Yellow Wallpaper was written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, and this is her most well-known work. So she's written other texts, other short stories, and even a novel, but this is the one that everybody reads in college. So I majored in English, obviously, and I uh, have a master's in English as well, and I've actually been asked to read by many instructors the Yellow Wallpaper at least three or four times. And I'll be honest, the first few times I read it, I really hated it. It wasn't until somebody sort of explained what was going on in the story that I sort of understood all the different elements. So let's talk about what's going on. First things first, let's get a little background on Charlotte Perkins Gilman. She was born in 1860, and she was born into sort of a very creative family, other writers, thinkers, revolutionary thinkers, that sort of thing. She grew up in a very lonely household. Her father had abandoned the family, and her mother, because of that, suffered from mental illness. In fact, mental illness ran in her family. Many of her family members had um, either attempted suicide or been hospitalized, and there's some evidence that that was hereditary. She herself was hospitalized for mental illness. The story was originally published in 1892, and it is in part semi-autobiographical. While the author never lived in a home with crazy yellow wallpaper um, and never sort of lost her mind and went and ripped all the wallpaper off the wall, she was hospitalized for mental illness by a doctor. He's very famous. His name was Dr. Weir Mitchell. And Dr. Weir Mitchell developed this cure called the rescuer. And basically, um, anytime a woman was suffering from depression, anytime she was suffering from any sort of malady whatsoever, um, generally the idea was that it came from overstimulation, that women had weak little brains, and if they read too much or had too many interesting conversations, their brains would break. And so he developed this rescuer. And basically it said women should devote themselves only to the domestic. They should cook and clean and take care of babies. They should not read. They should not write. They should not talk to interesting and stimulating people. And so Gilman tries to live by this cure for a while, and it almost breaks her. And it's not until she decides to go against this treatment and to start writing through her feelings that she starts to get better. So let's talk a little bit about the story. In the exposition, we get the setting. We have this sort of little um, or this large country house set uh, back far from the road. So it's isolated. We are introduced to our main characters. We are introduced to John, the husband, the wife, whose name is never mentioned, but who is our narrator, and to Jeannie or Jane, she's called both. And that is the husband's sister. We know that they're there so that the wife can recuperate. We know that she's just had a baby, and she's also been suffering from some um, mental issues. The husband thinks it's sort of a, a type of hysteria, and what we know now in the 21st century is that she was probably suffering from postpartum. So they move into this house, and it's, it has all these beautiful bedrooms, but the husband decides that they're going to take this um, nursery at the top of the stairs with um, this hideous yellow wallpaper. So hence the ugly color in the PowerPoint here. They take this room because it has lots of air. It will give her lots of air. And um, immediately she starts to become obsessed with this wallpaper. Um, and this obsession and also her isolation out in the country starts to um, cause this deterioration in her like in her mental state and she slowly starts to sort of kind of go crazy. She starts to sleep more and more during the day, stay up more and more during the night where she can explore the wallpaper. And then at one point, her husband's out of town for the day. She locks herself in the room. She rips off all the wallpaper um, and she like sort of ties herself in the room. And uh, her husband comes in and he's like, what are you doing? And she says, I've gotten out finally. So as she's been studying this wallpaper, she thinks she's seen somebody, this woman creeping behind the, the wallpaper, the pattern of the wallpaper that sometimes looks to her like bars. And um, what we learn is that um, this woman behind the wallpaper that she's seen and the narrator herself are really one, one person. And so when she's ripped off all the wallpaper, she says, I've gotten out finally, John, and you can't put me back. And he faints. He passes out. And she just keeps creeping around the room. And that's kind of the end of the story. That's it. So let's talk about some of the literary elements. Let's talk about the setting. We know that the house is this sort of colonial mansion, and it's set far back from the road. 
So we talked a little bit about isolation when we read the storm. Isolation can bring people freedom, but generally isolation is associated with depression. And in this case, it is her isolation, the narrator's isolation from her friends and from her colleagues, other writers, that really leads to her mental deterioration. And this isolation is caused in part by her husband. He has decided that they're going to take this house. The secondary setting is the nursery itself. So as I mentioned before, the house is filled with these big, beautiful rooms. She wants to take one on the bottom floor. It's beautifully decorated, um, has lovely wallpaper, and it has a door out into the garden. And he says, no, we're going to take the nursery at the top of the stairs. And one of the reasons he chooses it is because he says she can get lots of air. There's lots of windows in that room, and so she can get lots of air. Um, a nursery, so the question on the slide says, what is a nursery for? A nursery is for a baby, right? Um, and you see that this nursery has been designed for a baby or for children. There are bars on the window. There are these little chains uh, with rings on the end of them in the walls. And um, all of these things are meant to be for a child to protect them or to give them something to play with. And so by placing his wife in this nursery, John is in, in fact infantilizing, um, making his wife a baby, a child. And we see him treating her like a child throughout much of the story. At one point, he calls her a little girl and tells her to get back in bed before she catches a cold. At another point, she asks if she can go visit some of her friends and he tells her no. Um, at one point, she starts to cry and he picks her up in his arms and carries her like a child to bed. And then he reads to her uh, until she falls asleep. All of these things are um, sort of very similar to the way a parent treats a child. And in fact, John's relationship with his wife is that of a parent to a child. So the point of view, the story is told from the point of view of the wife. So this makes it a first person narration. Remember that anytime we have a first person narrator, we have to ask ourselves, is that narrator trustworthy? Well, our narrator is slowly going crazy. She develops at one point a split personality. She is both herself, John's wife, and this creeping woman behind the wallpaper. She's both. And so because she has this sort of mental split, this mental break, she isn't really trustworthy. And that's kind of interesting, especially when you consider how she describes her husband. She calls her husband, oh, dear John, he's so kind. He takes all care from me. Again, she's not trustworthy. Not, she's not reliable. So when she describes her husband as this kind, loving man, we have to take those words with a grain of salt, right? Here's this crazy woman. And this crazy woman thinks that her husband is kind and loving when really he's sort of her jailer. Okay, so let's talk about imagery and symbolism. We know that imagery is the way in which an author uses language and sensory descriptions to create a picture for the reader. And a, sim a symbol is a thing that represents an idea or an ideal. So when you read the yellow wallpaper, the most important image or picture that the author gives us is also the most important symbol, and that is the wallpaper itself. So let's look at the, uh, some passages from the yellow wallpaper that describe the paper on the wall. Okay, so in this passage, um, the author describes the, the wallpaper. It says, it's dull enough to confuse the eye in following, pronounced enough to constantly irritate and provoke study. And when you follow the lame, uncertain curves for a little distance, they suddenly commit suicide, plunge off at outrageous angles, destroy themselves in unheard of contradictions. The color is repellent, almost revolting, a smoldering, unclean yellow, strangely faded by the slow turning sunlight. What's interesting here is some of the language that she uses. The wallpaper provokes study. It commits suicide. She's sort of personifying the wallpaper, giving it really massive power in the, the narrator's understanding of it, right? She's making it like a person. It has some sort of power or control over her. So here it says, the color is hideous enough and unreliable enough and infuriating enough, but the pattern is torturing. You think you have mastered it, but as you get well underway in following, it turns a back somersault and there you are. It slaps you in the face, knocks you down, and tramples upon you. It is like a bad dream. There is a recurrent spot where the pattern lulls like a broken neck, and two bulbous eyes stare at you upside down. More than once, the author talks about there being heads or eyes within the wallpaper pattern itself. So here's the question. What the hell is going on with the wallpaper? And here is the key to understanding this story. The panopticon and power. 
The Panopticon was a design for a prison created by Jeremy Bentham, in which each prisoner would be contained in a solitary cell, and the cells would be placed around a central tower. The prisoners would not be able to see the guards in the tower, so they couldn't see in. The guards could see out, but they couldn't see in. And so the prisoners would never know from one minute to another whether or not they were being monitored. So I'm going to flip back to the last slide to show you that design again. So here is that central tower with the bright lights at the top, which make it impossible for the prisoners in these cells to see in. So if somebody doesn't know that they're being monitored, they're going to behave at all times as though they were being monitored. The idea was to imprint in the criminal's mind that they're constantly being watched, right? And so that when they leave prison, they'll continue to behave as though they're under constant surveillance and be less likely to commit crimes. Now, we know that this doesn't necessarily work, um, but it's, it's an interesting concept. And it's a concept that kind of um, got the attention of a French theorist. His name is Michel Foucault. So Michel Foucault argued that Society is pretty much designed around this concept of panoptic control. Schools, governments, churches, all of these things employ panoptic control or make people feel like they're being watched at all times. And so um, on the slide it says, can you think of any panoptic forms of control used by schools, governments, churches, or even parents? In the past, students have said to me things like, find my phone. Their parents will have things like, find my phone. So anytime they leave, their parent can just sort of check on the app and know exactly where their kid is. Um, even younger children, so talking about Christmas, Santa is a form of panoptic control. He sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. You may have even heard of the elf on the shelf. The elf on the shelf is this um, idea of this um, like this little elf that parents buy and they put it on the shelf in the kid's bedroom and every night they come and move it somewhere else. So the young child is encouraged to believe that the elf is alive and the elf will tell uh, Santa if they do something wrong. This is constant panoptic control. Schools have cameras everywhere. Um, uh, traffic lights have cameras on them. And even God can be thought of as a form of panoptic control because he not only sees everything you're doing, but he sees into your heart, into your mind. And that is supposed to control how we think and feel and act. So there are all these panoptic elements in the story, right? The paper looks to me as if it knew what a vicious influence it had. There is a recurrent spot where the pattern lulls like a broken neck and two bulbous eyes stare at you upside down. Here comes John's sister, such a dear girl she is. I must not let her catch me writing. He is so careful and loving and hardly lets me stir without special direction. I have a scheduled prescri prescription for each hour of the day and he takes all care from me. So one of the things that drives this narrator crazy is the constant never ending surveillance that she lives under. And we know from talking to POWs that this is actually one of the things that drives them crazy as well. Yes, the torture is awful, the deprivation, the lack of food, all that kind of stuff is, is horrible, but the worst thing is never knowing when and if they're going to be watched.